Thank you, choir. That was uh, thrilling for me, and uh, I hope everyone else enjoyed it as much as I did. I got to singing right along with them. And, uh, and what a ministry and song. What a blessing. Praise God for you. And um, these days are upon us for these snap meetings. And that's basically what this is. I uh, got in touch with your pastor and I said, Pastor, I, um, I would like to come and preach for you if it's possible. And um, he said, uh, when? I said, very soon. <laughs> I had a cancellation down in Sydney, and uh, he most graciously uh, worked it out because I had to come back to Brisbane anyway. And uh, I thought, what better place could I go than to Sunshine Baptist Church and uh, uh, enjoy the fellowship of the saints? Even if you didn't have me preach, I was coming anyway. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and you may say, well, I wish we didn't have you preach. Just come and don't preach. But anyway, I'm so glad. That it worked out, and uh, I'm just thrilled uh, to be here tonight. And I hope that uh, you are as well uh, excited about the fact, as Pastor's already told us, that we have such a wonderful Savior to sing about. Amen? Just think what life would be without him. Oh, my. I don't want to think about that. Uh, it would be absolutely horrific to be uh, living in this world as it is tonight. Uh, without the Lord Jesus Christ. I need him. And I need him every hour. For as the psalmist said, he's my hiding place. Amen. I have found a hiding place. When sore distressed, Jesus, rock of ages, strong and true. And in a weary land, I in his shadow rest. He is my strength in all that I do. Oh, Jesus, rock of ages, let me hide in thee. Jesus, rose of Sharon, fair and pure to me. Lily of the valley, bright and morning star, why he's the fairest of ten thousand. To my soul, I found the sweetest flower that ever grew. Jesus, rose of Sharon, fair and pure. He's my joy and comfort, blessed friend, so true. Why, he blooms within my heart evermore. I have found a lovely star that shines on high. Jesus, bright and morning star to me. And in the night of sorrow, he is ever nigh. And he drives the darkest shadows away. Oh, Jesus. Rock of ages, let me hide in thee. Jesus, rose of Sharon, sweet thou art to me. Lily of the valley, bright and morning star. Why, he's the fairest of ten thousand. To this man's soul. What a hiding place. I had one when I was a kid. As a matter of fact, I had several. I had to have several because I had an older brother who was always after me. And I didn't like what he did to me when, I got, when he caught up to me because I had done something terrible to him and he was going to get his revenge. But I also had a hiding place when the thunder and lightning came. I didn't like it. Uh, we uh, used to get a lot of heat lightning in the, the valley where I grew up. And uh, as, as a young fellow, I just knew that uh, something bad was about to happen. And so uh, no matter where we were, uh, many times in the old car, uh, I'd just kind of tuck myself up underneath my father's arm 
uh, as we rode down the road toward that heat lightning. And uh, when the storms came, uh, I oftentimes crawled in back of the chair that was in the corner and stayed there until the storm passed by. But I found a better hiding place than all of those and many, many others. It's Jesus. Uh, he's my hiding place for all things uh, today and has been very faithful to me in that area. Take your Bible tonight and turn with me to the Old Testament, to the book of Zechariah, chapter 1. Zechariah, just before Malachi, so we're not too far from the close of the Old Testament. You have Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. But Zechariah chapter 1 tonight for a few minutes. And uh, just to put you in context of Zechariah's uh, time, and uh, what was going on, he was a prophet who was involved with the remnant uh, that had been left behind after the great uh, capture of Israel and the uh, time of uh, captivity. Zechariah is speaking to the remnant that's left behind here. And uh, it's also prophetic. Now, I'm not going to get into a prophetic message tonight. I'll leave that for some other time. But I have something here that I want to lift off the page and ask a few questions of ourselves tonight. It says, in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idu, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways, and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for thy word. Thank you that it is a rich and full fountain, a well that has no depth of limitation. It's an endless supply of our uh, spiritual and practical instruction for us, your people. And I pray tonight that as pastor has already admonished us, each one of us would take at least one nugget, perhaps more. Enrich us, dear Lord, tonight by illumining our understanding and helping each one of us to grapple with and attain that truth that you have for us. If there be a lost person here tonight, O oh God, I pray that they would be severely convicted of that condition, lost, undone, without Christ in this present world. And being convicted, I pray that they would turn in repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. 
and the Spirit of God could usher them and bear them into the glorious family of God, granting them eternal life, forgiveness of sin, and a home in heaven. So I pray that you'll take control now. Uh, Help me, the preacher. Help these, the hearers. Help all of us to heed thy truth tonight. We'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, The Spirit of God is reminding these people that there had been an ongoing work prior uh, to them, their fathers. I had a father and mother. I'm sure you're not surprised about that. One lady told my wife one day, she said, I think Glenn was born under a rock. My wife said, what are you talking about? She said, nobody would have hatched anything like that. Anyway, that made me feel real good, you know. (laughs) Anyway, she was uh, she was a bit of a strange bird herself. And anyway, <laughs> my wife just shook her head. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I had a mother and father, and um, for a long time, my brother had me convinced that I was an orphan they picked up alongside the road, that I was left in a basket, and just. Uh, Uh, They felt sorry for me, and I had done nothing but create problems ever since they brought me home. And, you know, that can be quite debilitating, especially when you're four and five years old and say, well, you know, what's the world? You know, my brother was three and a half years older than myself, and I I finally found out that he was, uh, shall we say, exaggerating. (laughs) A liar. Anyway, um, (laughs) I got my comings up with him afterwards, and... Um, he's, he turned out to be a pretty good brother. I don't want to um, assassinate his character because he's already with the Lord. But uh, he was a good brother. We had many a wonderful blessings of the Lord together. And uh, I'm thankful for him. But we did um, act like typical young fellas do. And uh, But I was innocent. I want you to know that. I was just innocent as pure driven snow. I don't want to pretend that uh, you know, he was all bad and I was all good, but it's pretty true. It's not too far from the truth. Okay, we're strayed far enough. Um, they had fathers that had uh, been admonished by the prophets sent to them from God. And uh, uh, as he says, uh, be not as your fathers unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, thus saith the Lord in verse 4. Uh, Turn ye now from your evil ways. In other words, their fathers were practicing evil. Uh, Evil ways uh, and doings, evil doings. Uh, You know, we don't really like to be confronted with that kind of truth, do we? None of us like to be confronted with the fact that we uh, are sinners uh, and that sinners do sinful things have sinful thoughts, have mischievous hearts. We don't necessarily like to be confronted when we're unsaved about the fact that we have mocked God in the past, perhaps blasphemed his name, perhaps taken his name in vain and used it as a byword. We, we, you know, we, we, we don't like to be confronted uh, because it is an affront to us that uh, the person confronting us uh, would think less of us than what we think of ourselves. Uh, that's basic P-R-I-D-E, isn't it? <laughs> and all of us have the problem of P-R-I-E-D. Uh, we all have uh, that which uh, tries to project uh, our bad behavior onto others. The blame game. Uh, I remember the baseball went through the front door window one day, and I heard Mother say, who did that? And I said, Gary did it, and he said, Glenn did it, and Judy said, they both did it. The three children. And then Gary and I turned and said, no, it was Judy. <laughs> 
because mother was going to exact some punishment. And, you know, Judy was the oldest, so let her handle it, right? But anyway, we like to blame others for what we're guilty of. And uh, these were no different, these people. They were doing evil things in evil ways. And God sent them prophets and said, look, turn from that. I, I want to bless you, but while you're doing evil things and committing evil deeds and doings, I'm going to withhold my blessings. We'll look at that in a moment. But this is what had been going on. And, uh, you know, they didn't hear. And then uh, the Lord talks about the fact that his words and his statutes, which he commanded his servants, the prophets, uh, did they not take hold of your fathers? And there were times when Israel would, in fact, listen, repent, and repent. Oftentimes it took a great deal of suffering, though. It's, it's like they held their foot up in the air and took the rifle and shot a hole in their foot every time they were turning around, uh, rather than to uh, bend the knee and confess with the mouth of Almighty God and, and let the Lord bring them back to a place of uh, righteousness and worship unto him all through the book of Judges. You can... Familiarize yourself, I'm sure, with it. But we find here, it says uh, that in verse 6, and they returned and said, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, what? God was going to do unto them something. And they said, according to our ways, He's going to treat them. He's going to do unto them according unto their ways and according to their doings. So hath he dealt with us. Now, I want us to think about lifting that phrase, so hath he dealt with us. Um, <clears throat> the night that I got saved, January 29th, 1973, at 11.45 p.m. at milepost 148 on the interstate highway near Albany, New York. I had been severely convicted of my condition to the place where I was actually shaking behind the steering wheel of the patrol car that I was driving as a police officer. And uh, I had been to a meeting such as this, and uh, the preacher had simply got up and preached from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 48 and 49. I can't give you the exact quotation at the moment, but he simply made this statement. As naturally as we were natural, so we should be naturally spiritual when we are born again. There should be something naturally spiritual about us if we are truly saved. And I said to myself that night, with all the profession of faith that I have, I don't want to read the Word of God. I don't want to uh, pray. I don't want to uh, get with God's people. I, I, I want to do something else. My desires were absolutely the antithesis of what a Christian should naturally want to do. For he said, desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. He said, not, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And, you know, to, to uh, go out of my way to go to church, uh, I would rather give an excuse to my wife and say, listen, darling, you go ahead. I worked all night and uh, I'm tired. I'm going to take a shower and and uh, get in a rack and go to sleep. Rather than to just go to church for an hour and a half and get preached to, I, I thought I would be better off just avoiding it for many different reasons. But I was lost. The night that I went to pick up my patrol car uh, and go to work, um, I found myself uh, just very, very upset that I couldn't control myself. I, as a police officer, you're supposed to be in control of any given situation, and you're the authority and all this business. And here I was, shaking like a leaf in the wind. Bothered me. And uh, I started reading out of a New Testament that had the Psalms in the back of it, which I kept in my breast pocket with my badge. 
uh, there had been a shooting of a police officer and uh, south of us, and he had been a Christian, and he had a New Testament in his pocket, and it stopped the bullet from penetrating his heart. And so I thought, well, good enough for him. <laughs> you know, hey, I'll take that. We didn't have Kevlar back 50 years ago. All we had was cotton, you know. No Kevlar vests, no bulletproof deals, no armor like they wear today. It was just, hey, stop, you know, bang, this guy. And if you uh, were a good shot, you won. If you were a bad shot, you lost. <laughs> but anyway, the long story of short of it was I was um, in my patrol car sitting there saying I'm a confused, lost man. And when I said lost, I said, oh, my you know, I'm lost. I need to be found. And I used to sing Amazing Grace, all of that in church, and it just never clicked how lost I was. And so I flipped open the New Testament and it came to the Psalms, and it came to Psalm 130. It says, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O God. So I just believed God was hearing me that night. And I kept flipping the pages, and it finally came to Psalm 103. And verse 10, and it says this, He, God, hath not dealt with you after your sins, nor rewarded you according to your iniquities. And then it was like he added, just especially for me, which I'm not adding to the word of God. This was just what came across my mind. He said, not yet, but I'm about to. I'm not going to fool around with you anymore. And so I knew immediately what my, my problem was. I was a person trying to be a Christian, but not trusting to be a Christian. You can work yourself until uh, the cows jump over the moon and pigs come home to roost or whatever the sayings are, but you'll never get saved if you're working for it. You have to trust what Jesus did for us. Now, with that in mind, he's not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. I want to ask you to look back here again. Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings. Let me ask you a question. Is God dealing with you after your ways and after your doings? Because he will. He does. And he has been. And so, I don't know about you, but I, you know, now that I'm on this side of the point of salvation, now that I'm on this uh, place in my life where I have been privileged to know the Lord for 45 years uh, and all of the uh, different things that have happened in my ministry over these many years, I am so thankful that God dealt with me in mercy in order that I might be saved. As a matter of fact, that's how he deals with all of us for salvation, in mercy. Mercy and grace and love. If God was not a merciful God, but was just a God of total justice, we'd never be here tonight. None of us. But thank God we are. He's dealt with us in mercy. He's dealt with us by extending grace. He's dealt with us in a loving, compassionate rescue of our eternal soul. So my questions to us tonight, and I think all of us need to answer them, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto me, what did he think to do unto me? Eternal ruination and condemnation because of my ways and my evil deeds and my unbelieving, faithless heart. Faithless heart. He thought to send me to a devil's hell, didn't he? For the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. But God, who is rich in mercy, sent Christ into the world to be our sin bearer. Now, I've had to sit down at times and over the years uh, 
get myself to contemplate the crucifixion in the many different facets of it. And it has been good for me to do that and to consider him who endured such contradiction against himself, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the pain that he could save us. Uh, sometimes we don't consider the horror or the price that was paid for us on Calvary's cross, but we should from time to time, I think, be more careful to think about what Jesus did in order to save us, in order to shed his blood, in order to have his body broken uh, for you and I on the cross, and then having taken our sin in his own body, he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's good for us to think about that. Because God wants to deal with us about salvation, and he will, and he will convict, and he will do his uh, uh, work of conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment by his spirit because he loves us and he's made already the payment for the, the sin of the whole world. For 1 Timothy 4.10 says, He is the Savior of the whole world, especially them that believe. So the blood of Jesus Christ could forgive all 7 billion people on the planet tonight and the 7 billion that have lived before us. There wouldn't be too many people for God to forgive because the blood has been shed for that purpose. We're not purchased by silver or gold or any precious substance, but by his blood. He saves us. Now, he has dealt with us in other ways. And I'm asking, is God dealing with you about the matter of salvation? Has he dealt with you in the past about the matter of salvation? Has he continued to ascend conviction? And convincing, persuading you of your waywardness and your desperate need of his mercy and grace. Because God will continue for a long time. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The long-suffering of God surpasses our ability to comprehend it. It's just unknown how long God would have waited for you to come around or myself. But that particular night, I just believed from the condition that I was in and from the word of God that he was finished dealing with me about salvation if I didn't respond that night. And so I bent the knee bowed before Almighty God, and I simply said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come into my heart and save me, and I don't care who thinks they know what. I'm telling you, I'm trusting you tonight as my Savior. And, of course, lots of things happen immediately. Now, God begins that good work in us, doesn't he? Uh, we can be confident of that, according to Philippians 1 and 6. I'm I'm confident that he who began the good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So I trusted Christ, and I'm placed in his hand and in God's hand, and nothing, not even my own desire, can take me away from that. The God who cannot lie promised that I would be saved. Then God begins to deal with us about our, uh, let's just say, shortcomings. Amen. Let's not get too sincere, uh, sin seriously about, you know, about uh, the part of our hair or whatever. But uh, let's let's be honest. When I got saved, I could still lie. I could still cheat. 
uh, I could still take something that I shouldn't have. Now, I suffered a consequence of it, and that was the Spirit of God, you know, gripping my heart and saying, who do you think you are? You're a child of God. You don't need to lie. You don't need to be a thief. You don't need to try to deceive people. And we're going to begin to work on that heart of yours, which God has saved. And the Spirit of God began to squeeze some of that stuff like juice out of my life. And it's sometimes kind of painful, Pastor. I mean, uh, it's not a rose-petaled walk to heaven, is it? Man, we got trials. We've got tribulation. We've got God working in us. Tribulation work of patience and patience works a good work in us. But you don't get it by just, you know, going willy-nilly down the road of life and, and think, well, it's all me. It's all my work. It's all uh, my direction. I'm going to just live my life the way I want. No, God says, I want to live out through you. And you're going to have to yield your vessel unto me. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but the life that I now live, I live by the faith of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And God wants that vessel of yours. And he wants it emptied of self. And self-righteousness. And all of these concepts which we've developed from humanism and secularism and all of the things that we got in these schools of humanism and secularism that have spoiled and sooted our, our minds. God wants to remove that stuff by taking the blessed word of God and cleansing us with the word in our Christian walk. So how does God deal with us? He deals with us by giving us a desire for his holy word. I'm so thankful for that. Um, no one ever accused me of being super intelligent. No one ever accused me of being um, a scholar. No one ever accused me of being uh, something more than just a, a common man with common needs, a need to learn, a need to have my intellect sharpened, a need to learn how to read, a need to learn how to write, and all of these things so that God can communicate with me and begin this wonderful work by his Spirit of taking that old crust and that old mold and worldly filth and remove it. God does that work. Man, I, <laughs> I try sometimes, but I say, Lord, every time I sweep it out this door, it comes rushing in the back door. Every time I go to the front door and sweep it out, it comes rushing in the back window. And when I close all the doors and windows, it's like a seething serpent, which will kind of come in under the door of my life and bite me right when I'm not ready. And I'm not thinking about it. How's God dealing with you? He's going to. He is. And he will continue. Because he loves us. He's dealing with us. According to our ways. Are you stubborn? I am. Still somewhat. Not nearly what I once was, praise God. He deals with my lack of holiness. And he brings things into my life which are going to uh, help me to grow in grace and admonition of the Lord Jesus. To be more like him. He's going to deal with us according to our ways and our doings. 
You ever find yourself doing something you didn't want to do and you did it anyway? Man, what? how crazy is that? You know, I just know I shouldn't take that bowl of ice cream because I've had so many bowls of ice cream. I'm outgrowing my uniform here. And uh, for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not him to sin. Well, for me to, uh, you know, get stuck into the ice cream and uh, all the while knowing that this is the temple that God wants to dwell in. And there's lots of other things that I know this is a very shallow illustration. Please don't get me wrong. We, we all need our ice cream from time to time. Okay. But. You find yourself doing things that you don't want to do. And the result of that is what the Apostle Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? And then he says, But I thank God in Jesus Christ. That's who's going to give us deliverance out of these things. Help us not to do the things we don't want to do. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Now, our escape, singularly, every time, is going to be the person of Jesus Christ. Flee. Flee to Jesus. Every time that you are tempted above uh, your physical resistance, tempted above your mental resistance, tempted above these things which are going to cause you to be hindered in your Christian walk, flee to the Lord. Get on your knees before his word and just say, God, I'm not going to turn loose until you take care of it. Jacob did that, didn't he? Of course, he walked away with a hollow in his hip, but he got the victory. Now, how is God dealing with us according to our ways and according to our doings? This is pretty Deep theology right there. No, it's not. It's simple. If you're doing something evil, if you're doing that which God doesn't want, if you're going in the wrong direction on a, on a pathway which is contrary to God, how is he going to deal with you? He's going to reach into your life and he's going to cause you to come back onto the path of righteousness and he's going to cut off whatever it is that your hand is doing that's displeasing to him. It's amazing how in our stubbornness, God begins out with little things. Just little things. I'll correct you here. But we don't listen, so he has to get a little stronger. So he goes from a loving call to driving a bulldozer over you if he has to. I mean, it's just the way God works. He, he's not going to always chide with us. He's going to work, and he's going to deal with us after our ways and our doings. So now let's take it from the negative over to the positive for a couple of minutes. How's God going to deal with us if we are doing the right thing on the way of righteousness? Blessings are going to fall because he loves that. Now, I've heard it, and I'm sure you've heard it. Basically, the Spirit of God deals with us in two ways. I say three, but most of the time, two will work. He's either chastening you, convicting and going after you in a place of waywardness or doings that aren't right in agreement with God. Or he's going to bless you in the way which he has given you. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in the path of righteousness for thine own dear name's sake. So God's going to work in a righteous way and, and fill our hearts with the joy of his presence and of his power and of all the things that he wants to uh, have us to do, empowering us to uh, do this wonderful ministry of reconciliation that he's called every one of us to. We're all ambassadors of Christ. We're either good ones or we're no good. And we can only be good ones with his help. Amen. So, I also think there's a third thing that we ought to consider. 
He may just let us sit and stagnate. And oh my. How putrid that can be. I mean, how many stink. And, and you're, you're just, you know, you're just not feeling God's presence either in chastening or you're not understanding God's presence in blessing. And the devil comes in there and he says, see, it's all been a figment of your imagination. And oh my, is that not miserable? Is that not hurtful? Is that not just a, a terrible place to be when God leaves us alone? There's no more lonely person in the world than a Christian who's not either being chastened or blessed. The Spirit of God can just say, okay, you want it your way? You don't want to submit? You want to just uh, go the other direction? I'll let you do it for a while. See how you like it. I don't like it. Uh, And I'm sure you don't either if you've ever been there. I would much rather feel the whip of the Spirit of God and knowing that it's from him because he loves me, than to go without it. I would much rather than that, (laughs) I don't want that, but if that's what I'm going to have, I would rather have that than grow stagnant and, and have him to be silent in my life. But much rather than that, I would much rather have the joy of the Lord as my strength by being on the way of righteousness and my doings And in my ways, having God dealing with me. Because God does, in fact, deal with his people. How is he dealing with you tonight? How has he been dealing with you? And what do you expect God to be dealing with you about tomorrow? That's some good question, isn't it? All right. So he says, my words and my statutes which I commanded my servants the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways, according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. So has he dealt with us. Word of God is going to take hold of us. And we can resist it. We can push it aside. Or we can embrace it from a full desire. I just say, yes, dear Lord. I want what you want. And I want to go where you want me to go. And I want to do what you want me to do. Because you saved my wretched soul. And because you love me. And because... You care for me, and Lord, you're my God, as the psalmist said in Psalm 63. And because you're my God, I'm going to put that to use. I'm going to start claiming what you would have me to claim in thy name. I'm going to start living what you how and what you want me to live. I'm going to pursue thee, O God. I'm going to pursue the righteous things of God. I am not going to just slip into some oblivious place of stagnation. I'm not going to do that. I would rather, dear Lord, that you take me on home to heaven than for me to just stagnate in this life and be uninfluential in the lives of the people that I know and love and rub shoulders with every day. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for that truth that you do deal with us and work with us. That this is your work and this is your way. This is the ministry of the Spirit of God to us. And oh God, I count it a great blessing in my life that I have a God. And I have the God. And I have the creator of the universe as my God. I am thankful, oh God, that I can call upon thee at any moment of any day. I can plead the blood of Christ. I can... A rush to the foot of the cross. I can get into thy Bible and you can speak to me, O God, and accompany me in this journey that I'm on. 
Help me to count my blessings and to name them and to rejoice in them and to feast spiritually upon the one who sent them. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.